they're gonna railroad me again, set me up. Where they set me up the first time, I had to do it 18 years to prove my innocence. If you are a fan of true crime and have seen the hugely popular documentary on Netflix, Making a Murderer, then you likely know the name Stephen Avery. Stephen Avery was convicted in 2005 of being responsible for the passing of Teresa Hallback. But it doesn't seem to be as simple as all that. I'm Adam Andrews with Where Are They Now and today we're talking about none other than Stephen Avery. Stephen Avery was born July 9th, 1962 in Mantua County, Wisconsin, where he was raised and lived with his family who owned a salvage yard in Two Rivers. From a young age, Stephen was on a less than ideal path in life. Stephen reportedly had an IQ of about 70 and didn't do too well in school, eventually dropping out when in high school. Like in 1981 when he was convicted of burglarizing a bar and later served 10 months in jail. The following year in 1982, Stephen pled guilty to animal cruelty after he poured gasoline on a sweet little kitty and tossed it into a bonfire for which he was rightfully sentenced to 9 months. In 1985, he again found himself on the wrong side of the law when he forced a car driven by Sandra Morris off the road and pointed a firearm at her. Sandra was a cousin of his who was the wife of a sheriff's deputy and according to Avery, his intention was to stop her spreading rumors about him allegedly exposing himself a number of times which she filed a complaint for in 1984. For this crime, he was sentenced to 6 years but was granted bail. So Avery had a few run ins with the law, making him a problem for the police in the area and thanks to the issue with his cousin, who was a sheriff's deputy's wife, Avery was on extremely thin ice, ice that began to crack and break. On July 29, 1985, a woman named Penny Bernstein was unfortunately a victim of a attack on a beach near Two Rivers. Now Penny gave a description of the assailant and police believed that this description resembled the troubled Avery. After Bernstein picked him out of a photo lineup of suspects, Avery was arrested despite the fact that 16 people testified that he was elsewhere at the time of the attack. Further evidence provided by a state forensic official seemed to indicate a hair found on one of Avery's shirts that was consistent with that of the victim. Six months after the attack in December of 1985, Avery was convicted of the crime and sentenced to 32 years in prison. This is the beginning of Avery being allegedly falsely accused of crimes, and it is nowhere near the end. You see, many people had doubts about his guilt. In fact, another name came up in suspicion of the case. Another local man named Gregory A. Allen, who was suspected in other crimes. Interestingly though, law enforcement officials never investigated this suspect. Avery fought for and maintained his innocence of the crime, and his case got picked up by the Wisconsin Innocence Project in 2001. The project was granted a court order for DNA testing of a hair that had been found on the victim at the time of the crime. Now, in September of 2003, that same hair was matched to none other than Gregory A. Allen, thanks to new DNA analyzing technology. At the time, Allen was already in prison for another sexual related crime. He was charged, and all charges held against Avery were dropped, with him being released from prison after serving 18 years falsely accused. Not too long after Avery was released from prison, he filed a wrongful conviction lawsuit against the county, the district attorney, and the sheriff for $36 million. In the proceedings of this lawsuit, it came to light that in 1995, 10 years after his imprisonment and 8 years before his release, Detectives had learned that Gregory Allen, who was a prisoner in Brown County, literally confessed to committing a crime of the same nature in Manitowoc County that someone else was convicted of. And the authorities did absolutely nothing with that information. On October 31st, 2005, while the wrongful conviction lawsuit case was still going on, Teresa Hallback, a freelance photographer, drove to Avery's Auto Salvage, which is where Avery and other family members lived, in order to photograph a van that she wanted to list on Auto Trader magazine. According to Avery, he talked to her about the van, but that she left after taking the photographs. The problem is that unfortunately, Teresa Hallback was never seen alive again. On November 3rd of that year, a missing persons report was filed, and a search was undertaken to locate Hallback. Two days later, her vehicle was found on the outskirts of the Avery family's salvage yard. Over the following week, Halbach's car keys were discovered in Avery's house, with blood that belonged to Avery found in her car. In addition, human bones were recovered from a burn pit near Avery's home that were soon determined to belong to Teresa. And on top of that, more evidence was found that included a bullet found in Avery's garage that had Teresa's DNA on it. Avery was arrested, and while in jail, he settled his civil suit for $400,000. 
dollars. More than 35 and a half million less than he originally sued for. Avery maintained that his charges were a framing by the police and justice system to discredit his pending civil case. Manitowoc County's police department did in fact cede control of the investigation over to the neighboring Calumet County Sheriff's Department due to Avery's lawsuit against Manitowoc County. But the agreement was for Calumet to use resources from Manitowoc County including the county's personnel. Meaning Manitowoc County Sheriff's deputies participated in the repeated searches of Avery's trailer, garage and property only supervised by Calumet County officers. It was ultimately two Manitowoc deputies who had been required to testify in Avery's civil suit who found the key to Halbach's vehicle in Avery's bedroom, although several earlier searches had come back with nothing. Avery's attorneys claimed that there was a huge conflict of interest in the Manitowoc personnel's participation and suggested evidence tampering. To add to the car key evidence found by a Manitowoc deputy, Avery's attorneys also discovered that an evidence box containing a vial of Avery's blood that was collected in 1996 during his appeals efforts in the Bernstein case had been unsealed and contained what they believed to be a new puncture hole visible in the stopper. Stevens' attorney brought to the court the idea that the blood found in Halbach's car could have been drawn from the stored vial and planted in the vehicle to incriminate Avery. To combat this claim, the prosecution presented testimony by FBI technicians who had tested the blood recovered from Halbach's car for EDTA, which is an acid and a preservative that is used in blood vials, but is not found in the human body, and they found none in this blood sample. In March of 2006, Brendan Dassey, Stephen Avery's 16 year old nephew with an IQ in the borderline deficiency range, who was enrolled in special education classes and who stood as Stephen's alibi, was interrogated by police investigating the case. Dassey was interrogated on four occasions over a 48 hour period, including three times in a 24 hour time frame with no legal representative, parent, or other adult present. During this interview, Brendan told detectives that he and Stephen had committed the crimes. Now the problem with these interrogations is that Dassey was interrogated via the read technique. A technique which was developed to encourage law enforcement officers to use tactics that pressure suspects to confess. Now this in tandem with the fact that Dassey had been clinically evaluated as being highly suggestible, which makes a suspect more compliant and can ultimately lead to improper interrogation outcomes such as false confessions, led to a US magistrate judge describing his confession as clearly involuntary in a constitutional sense. But that opinion was overturned by an appeal at court. Dassey later recanted claiming that the confession was coerced, all the same Dassey was charged with various crimes, even though there was no physical evidence against him. After a 27 day trial, Avery was found guilty of the crime as well as illegal possession of a firearm in March 2007. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Later on in that same year, Brendan Dassey was also found guilty and given a life term, though he was eligible for parole but in 2048. In 2015, Avery and Dassey drew international attention with the airing of Making a Murderer on Netflix. The 10 part series was made by Maura Demos and Laura Ricciardi, who first began working on the project in December 2005. While the program was an immediate hit with viewers, many of whom became amateur sleuths, a number of those involved in the case objected to how they were portrayed and claimed that the series omitted evidence that supported Avery's conviction. Afterwards, the legal battle for Brendan Dassey's confession, plus further battles for Avery's innocence, were chronicled in Making a Murderer Part 2 in 2018. Stephen Avery is currently at the Waupun Correctional Institution, a maximum security prison in Wisconsin that housed 934 inmates as of June 2021. Avery's ex fiance Sandy Greenman has said that Avery is a model inmate who has never faced discipline or ever had an infraction against him. Greenman says she talks on the phone with Avery almost every day but COVID restrictions had halted their in person visits. Avery reportedly has his own cell which he is not allowed to leave to eat. He usually only leaves his cell to shower according to Greenman. And Stephen regularly responds to letters from supporters and sometimes calls them or talks to them on zoom. Greenman runs a Facebook group dedicated to Avery's innocence and she often posts thank Thank you notes which Avery addresses to the 22,000 members. Greenman believes Avery is legally barred from corresponding with Dassey who is incarcerated at Oshkosh Correctional Institution in Wisconsin. So that's the story of Stephen Avery. The question of his innocence is still being debated but the real victim, Teresa Halbach, is the one who deserves justice. But what do you guys think? We love to hear your thoughts so leave it all in the comments below and don't forget to like and subscribe. For now though I've been your host Adam Andrews and I'll see you all next time on Where Are They Now. He began to commit minor crimes like in 1981 when he was convicted of burglary.
Man, burgerizing, could you imagine?